in the Lord's Church on His Resurrection Sunday. Amen. I welcome you, church family, friends, um, anyone that's watching us online. What a blessing it is to have guests with us in person or just wherever they are. We pray that the Lord will bless you in this time as we celebrate Him and make much of Him. Amen. If you look in your bulletin, we have announcements and prayer requests. Uh, because of the time and, and precautions, we, we do not pass the, the tithe plate, but it will be in back. Uh, please remember the, the work of the Lord and continue to worship Him this time. Uh, we'll still have that time. I'll still have a prayer for that time. But let's remember the work of the Lord and, and worship Him even in the giving of our tithes and gifts. Uh, keep looking on Facebook. Our Facebook is where you find um, uh, a bunch of resources on us. And uh, including um, help for your daily prayer uh, and um, and Bible reading life. We put Bible reading plans on there. I hope you will enjoy that. It's all our job to help each other grow in the Lord and walk strong together. Amen. 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 Some of our prayer requests. We lift up the Comer family, Miss Melissa and, and her young ones as they still struggle with, with help. Uh, Mr. Hollis Comer, who's still hospitalized, I understand. He's home. Okay. Yeah. We're thinking okay. he's home. Yeah. What a blessing. We'll turn that yeah. from a prayer to a praise. Amen. 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 And just all the stuff going on in our nation. So many other things going on in the religious world as I read up on that every day at work and just some of the craziness that, that's going on. We really need to uh, lift up that God's hand will be over leading all folks. And so we continue to also pray for our health, the health of the world in this crazy time both physically for COVID and all the other craziness going on. Amen. Amen. Sometimes I think God sees us as kids in the back seat, not getting along. <laughs> and uh, we really need to. His people need to leave that way. Any other prayer requests we have this morning? Let's get started. I'd like to remember the Cole family um, from my past for bereavement. Mm. Um, Gary Cole, uh, this was my former boss at Hillco's husband passed away in mm. these days. Mm. And um, he was 61, which is relatively young. Mm -hmm. And but he had a heart battle. And I'd like to remember their entire family. And then I have an unspoken. God knows, but they haven't given me liberty to mm -hmm. say that. Other requests, other prayers. You can pray for me. I've uh, just worked twice this, this week going in to try and figure out if I just have allergies going crazy or if something else is there because it's still more of a struggle than it seems it should be. Yes, ma'am? I have a praise God for what he's done for me in this past six months. If it weren't for him, I wouldn't be here today. Amen. Amen. <laughs> we are so blessed to have you back and, and happy to see your smiling face here. Anything else? Let's go to the Lord in prayer. God, thank you for this time. Thank you for your people. Thank you for our country that allows us to meet together. Uh, there are so many brothers and sisters throughout the world who that is not a given. That is not a right they have. And yet they are found faithful. So Lord, may, that, may us be faithful. Yeah. May, us, may we be found faithful. May we sing as loudly as the freedom to sing allows us. May we fellowship more openly that the world will see our love for each other. Lord, may we do your will and be like you as most we can with your guidance. Be with us in this time as we celebrate you, celebrate the resurrection. Be with us as we continue to worship this song. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Pastor.
God saves. That's who we serve. That's who we celebrate. That's who rose from the grave. As it comes time to give our offerings, let me pray for us that the Lord will be in our, in our heart and our mind and in our ears. God, thank you, Lord, that you want our interaction. You want relationship with us. You want our partnership in everything. Lord, everything we have is yours. 
that we give it to you. Lord, not because our hands are special or the gift is special, but because you're special. And so may you take, bless, and use for your kingdom's glory all that's given in this offering, all that's given in our lives, and make all of it go to your glory. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Take one. Can you press play? every day. I'm doing three and four people's jobs at one time. Mm -hmm. They say I, they don't know how I hold up to this, mm -hmm. but somebody's got to keep the nursing home going. That's I'm a dietary aide. I'm in, I'm in charge with all those diabetic people and the people that can't eat certain meats and things like that. I take care of all of them. Mm -hmm. And they all just love me down there. They just worship me. I don't know why, but they just they just love me to death. When because I walk to the door, they come running in their wheelchairs after me. You're a blessing. I, mean, I can't even get in the kitchen. And they say, can you make me a peanut butter sandwich? <laughs> and I'm not even in the kitchen yet. So <laughs> I says, I will in a little while. Well, I'm going to sing, he's alive because Jesus is alive. Mm -hmm. He shed his blood on Calvary for us, but he rose. And he came and he's here. He's, a, he's, a, he's alive again. Amen. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to sing this song if I have a voice. Um, <laughs> can you? And turn it up a little bit so I can hear I'm, I'm dead too.
will be, the Lord is risen indeed. So let's try one more time. The Lord is risen. The Lord is risen indeed. Risen indeed. It is the stalwart of our faith. It is the anchor on which everything else is connected. Everything else is tied down. I once uh, was, was talking with some folks and I think it was a debate setting and a guy wanted to disprove everything and say it was all wrong because it was a claim of a miracle. I said, well, yeah, we believe in God, and guess what? We believe God can do miracles. Amen. I don't believe Bubba and Bubba of, of the faith can do miracles. I can't do miracles. But, of course, if we believe in God, we believe He can do miracles. Amen. Amen. Let me put this away. Put it on, and I almost forget. <laughs> Got a sore throat today. A little funny advice for you. Don't have one of these on, and then have a throat lozenger. Because then it goes right in your oh. eyes. So, I wouldn't cry a little while ago if it was on. But, uh, He's on antibiotics, brother. The anchor of everything, the proof of everything, is in the resurrection. It's the very center of our faith. Often we will we'll focus more, maybe because it's easier to fully understand the sacrifice that He made. He died for us. But it doesn't mean anything unless he comes back to, to, from the grave. Paul himself said that. If he is not risen, then we are most to be uh, pitied because we're still dead in our sin and our message means nothing. He proved it by his resurrection. Today is Resurrection Sunday. We call it Easter. Hmm. If you ever wonder about the name, a couple of facts. The, the name comes from the Latin. Some folks have claimed uh, different places, some pagan origins, which was which would say it means spring, um, but it looks to be more from the Latin going through the German and getting us the word for dawn being uh, Easter. And so that's where we get the name. One of the most ancient of uh, celebrations of the faith, uh, really tying on to the idea of the Lord's Day, which is of course Sunday. Early on, believers write immediately would the gather on Sunday to remember the rising of the Savior. And very uh, few centuries later, we would distinguish ourselves differently from our roots in, in Judaism, although today we're going to look back at those roots, uh, by currently moving our day to Sunday. It is the Lord's Day, and as we do it regularly, we still observe the seventh day Sabbath and rest. We just moved it because Jesus' resurrection and the message of Jesus, the centrality and importance of him in the gospel was reason enough to move it. And virtually all believers in the faith uh, do that. Our Easter is when it is because it used to be tied to the Passover. That's what we're going to talk a bunch of today to get some, some back in the ground roots uh, for understanding Easter. And the Passover uh, uh, is why although we've changed uh, a little bit from it, the Passover is why 
uh, Easter kind of falls where it is, and why it kind of changes as it changes. Mm. They're on a different calendar than we are. The, the Eastern Orthodox still follow that old calendar, and they will sometimes have uh, different days, but we celebrated that time, put it on the, the closest Sunday to when the Passover was. But we eventually changed it so it wasn't tied to Judaism, and that's why it is um, after the spring equinox, the Sunday after the first full moon, after the spring equinox. So if you know all those uh, planetary ideas, then you can calculate it for us. Fortunately, we have other folks that do that ahead of time. Puts it right close. We're almost always within a couple weeks or two of the Passover, uh, but we are distinct from the Passover. And I think that's mostly that because we're trying to alienate from our Jewish heritage, our Jewish history, but because to, to accentuate that we're different. Mm. You see, they believe that a Messiah is still coming. Imagine when you're a young kid and you knew when the bus was coming and you went to go to the bus stop and you know about this time it came. But maybe that one day when you went to go to the bus stop, no one else was there. I wonder if everyone's sick, you might want to say. And it's still early. That time that they usually come, the bus is not come yet. So you sit there and wait and then it passes that time and you wonder and you still wait. When's the bus coming? And so the Jewish people are rejecting Jesus at that time and from that time since have been waiting for the Messiah that's already come. The Christ, the Greek word, Messiah, the Hebrew word, that means the anointed one, the chosen one, where the promises going back to the beginning of Genesis tell us that this promised one of God to deliver will come. You remember that first prophecy of the Messiah when God was given the punishment for that first sin? And he talked about the snake would strike the heel of the woman, but the woman's heel, or the seed of woman, singular, the seed of woman would crush the head of the snake. Mm. I said we would go back and look at roots. That's the first root of Easter. Easter is the eternal final blow. Evil still fighting, but they know they've lost the war. What more can they do? Well, makes me think of John 14. The thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy, but I come that might have life and have it to the full. And so we need to live that life, live it to the full, fully understanding Easter and its roots so we can celebrate it right. That's our title for today, Celebrate Easter. But to celebrate it right, we want to look and contemplate the roots in the past. So we're going to look at the past. And then we want to bring that all together and look at the actual time of the resurrection and get a greater comprehension from adding the roots to that understanding. And then we want to really commit to all that's telling us to do and what we do as we celebrate it and live it out in the future. And so let's talk about the Passover. Passover is a holiday the Jewish people celebrate that remembers when the angels that were sent for the firstborn of each household passed over some houses. So let's backtrack to that time and put ourselves in the feet of the Jewish people. God has made a claim for them and told this king of Egypt, the Pharaoh, who thought himself and his people thought he was both the king and the God in flesh, when he hears there is a God, a God of the Hebrew people, that says, you need to let my people go so they can come worship me. He says, no. Thinking, well, if I'm God, I can tell this guy no. And so God has ten plagues, ten proofs. That I am God and you are not, and you need to really do what I tell you to do. And so they suffer. And to some extent, the people of God suffered, but in many ways, He protected them. When the different things came and they tortured that, that great country, Egypt, great in how big and how strong it was, and how little the people of God were. By the way, isn't it great how our God makes us big enough? No matter what we're up against, He makes us big enough. You don't have to be the best on the right team, but if you're on the right team, it's always a good place to be. Amen. And so God made a claim for them and had these proofs, these punishments for not obeying God. For thinking Pharaoh that he was God. And so there's a lot of suffering, but then the last blow is God continued to let him harden his heart. You remember, was the firstborn. And in that he claims all the firstborn of all his people. Because although he saved those, he still had full ownership of them because he is the one who passed over them. Because remember, as he sends the angel to do 
the deed of showing God's justice, because let's be, let's be honest, it was an obedience issue. Whether you know he's God or not, even Pharaoh, you need to obey me. And he did not, and there are consequences all throughout the Old Testament. And uh, family life is built on this, church life is built on this. There's the importance of leadership and often cites of, and examples of consequences for not following that leadership or for that leadership doing their own thing. Amen. Remember two, Israel turned into two, two different lines in that northern kingdom. The southern kingdom had some good kings, some bad kings. That northern kingdom, the one that wasn't in Jerusalem, by the way, was the majority. The Bible says none of them were ever good kings. Hmm. And so to obey God, even to Pharaoh, this foreign guy who thought he was God, God expects everyone to obey him. And in this way, he forced that obedience. One, the deliverance of the people. Remember, as the, the angels are going to take the firstborn of each household, that he tells the people of God. Isn't it great that when we don't know the answer, God can see us through in, in his little whispers, in his little plans, his little revelations. Because being a part of the family of God is key. Looking in the window doesn't make you part of the family. Mm -hmm. That's part of my my uh, testimony. I knew someone had shared with me the gospel and I knew about it, but that stubborn man in me, I want to do something. I want to do enough. I want to be enough. So lost as it was, because we can't be perfect. God is perfect. His heaven is perfect. There's nothing we could do to earn that. And it took me a while to get into my thick skull. But I remember the feeling when I was in church and gave my life to the Lord that I knew everything I needed to know was looking in the window of a perfect adoptive home that wanted me. And I was the one holding it up. Isn't it great that God adopts us? Mm -hmm. He drafts us into the tree. And so he had this huge price that he gave, or punishment that he gave on the Egyptian people, on Pharaoh himself, because he lost his son. But protected that from the people. And we get the term Passover because the angels came to those doors that were marked in that way from those sacrificed animals that he knew to pass over that house. Which is what? Well, the big picture is he delivered them from slavery to freedom. Isn't it great that God can set us free from anything that enslaves us? Mm -hmm. But at the local level, grace as what is deserved is passed over because of love. You see, the story has always been, God loved us. We don't know why, but God loves us. We don't deserve. We can never deserve. We can never be enough. But God loves us. Isn't it great how that's the hallmark of what society is, what family is, what forgiveness is? There's so many things tied to Easter. There's so many things tied to the resurrection. And Jesus tied the bow tight himself. He tied it on his authority. He tied it at times on the word. Tied the word to his own authority. No doubt will be taken away. No cross of the T will be taken away. The equivalent of these things. Until my story is fulfilled, he would say. Amen. And so there, he put his own identity promise of who he is and his promise to keep the Bible safe and pure and always infallible. Or inerrant, anyway. Not to define specific terms. And so he's always the center of the story. Even in death. And you know, even in death as we come to Easter, sometimes the greatest time in God is in the worst time for us. So that's God passing over the Hebrew people. Remember, before this, they were just a family. And then they became a nation. But they weren't a nation when they were just slaves. But then they came out of the strongest nation on earth. And as they were moving into the land that was occupied, that God said he was giving them, he overcome all those nations. So that the world will know. Remember the phrase? That there, everyone will know that there is a God in Israel. And so move the time frame forward to the time of Jesus. There is another occupation. It isn't slavery, but it's, it's not too far from it. It's the Roman Empire was in control of the land of Israel. And they had a puppet king, King Herod. If you don't know the history there, Herod is made king because of his father. His father helps 
uh, the half Jews, you remember the Samaritans and, and, and their things, kind of similar to that, to where he helped them in something with Egypt. And so they gave him and his family this um, political title seat. So if you wonder why, if you ever saw the movie of Jesus, why he's supposed to be the king of the Jews and he's partying like crazy, because he's more non religious than he is religious. And his backing is really from the Greeks, not the Jewish people. <coughs> and really the real rulers, the real leaders in the people of God are the religious leaders. And after three years of the Lord saying, I am the Messiah, they weren't on board. And so it came to this season. The Passover were coming. It's the Sunday before Passover. This was last week, Palm Sunday. And it's amazing stamp in history by God. Something big is going to happen. Jesus had come into, the, into Jerusalem several times. Uh, a number of those times he came in secretly. He came in not at the beginning. He came in quietly. But he comes in in the loudest, in, in the loudest way, the proudest way, in the midst of the most political and religious persecution. We see in one passage that, um, that he and, and the disciples are basically lying low to not be seen by everyone. But then a week later, he comes loudly into Jerusalem. Psalm Sunday. Because God was standing at the time. Pay attention. Something was going to happen. And so that week we call the Passion Week. Many things happened. Jesus did not back away from ministry and hide as historians have struggled with that truth. Because it was time. And then the persecution came. Thursday was the Passover meal. That remember the bitter herbs the bitterness of slavery, and now they're under the Romans. That, there's other bitterness here. Um, for the uh, the lamb, that there was a sacrifice for each family, a sacrifice for physical deliverance from slavery. Guess what? This deliverance was not from slavery. It was not temporal, just limited to this life. It was forever. How do we know that? Because he was using forever dice in this game, forever chips as his own life. God made man. The fully God, fully man, man would give his life. How does that happen? His power is fully there all the time. His volition is fully there. I mean, he could have stopped it at any time that he wanted to. There's a Christian song that says, why did it have to be nailed? His love would have kept him there. And so he lets himself be arrested right after the Passover meal. When they celebrated remembrance of Deliverance from God for the temporal thing of slavery. And then he plays out deliverance of God forever for your soul. And so he lets them take them. It's Thursday night, now considered Friday in the Jewish tradition. Their day starts in the evening. And so he starts to be persecuted. He goes through wrong trials, uh, wrong because they're not official how they're done. They're not really looking for really justice. They're trying to just push him over into... Um, into a, 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 a time of taking his life. Very interesting, they worked together with the Romans. The Jews, the religious organization didn't usually work with the Romans. You will hear it said sometimes that they weren't allowed to kill people. In the passage, the Bible actually says when they bring him to Pilate, he actually talks about how well, we're not allowed to put him to death. What happened to Stephen a little bit after this? They pick up stones and they do what? They had always done their own thing. That's how the Romans work. They took you over. They let you have your government. As long as you were peaceful, they let you do things your way. And so they did things their way. But so that the religious pressure, the political pressure, the whole world and the idea of Rome, pressure on mankind, and this beautiful, gentle, righteous life and message of Jesus would take the weight of all the heat and power those human things can bring down on someone. And so he died. His body gave up life. How did we, the people, think? Put yourself in those shoes. Who, how are you handling that? How did the disciples even handle that? We take all that to our story. The last chapter in each one of the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, that last chapter starts with the story of the resurrection. So we've looked and contemplated those other important ideas that, that help 
come to this time to solidify a greater comprehension of, of this time. So let's look in Luke 24 as we read the account of the resurrection. Luke chapter 24, verse 1. But on the first day of the week, at early dawn, they came to the tomb, bringing the spices which they had prepared. They'll tell us who they are in a moment. Spices were things they did to take care of the, the wrapping they had on the body when the body of the Jewish faith was, was when someone had died and they redo the, retake care of that wrapping. Verse 2, and they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. But when they entered, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were perplexed about this, behold, two men suddenly stood near them in dazzling clothes. And as the women were terrified and bowed their faces to the ground, the men said to them, Why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here, he has risen. Remember how he spoke to you while he was still in Galilee? saying that a son of man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified and the third day raise, rise again. And they remembered his words and returned from the tomb and reported all these things to the eleven and to all the rest. Now they were Mary Magdalene and Joanna and Mary the mother of James. Also the other women with them were telling these things to the apostles. But these words appeared to them as nonsense, and they would not believe them. But Peter got up and ran to the tomb, stooped and looked in. He saw the linen wrappings only, and he went away to his home, marveling at what had happened. The very center of our faith. The foundation of everything being true or false is on the reality of the resurrection. That Jesus really died and he really rose from the grave. As I said, this is all for the Gospels. I picked this one because it's particularly detailed, but also particularly a little bit more um, less specific on some issues. We're going to talk about all of them together here in a second. And the reason I do that is because the centrality at this point means we have to understand that the resurrection really happened. So here's the argument we often hear. We did this at Christmas. Same thing. I don't think nearly as good a case um, on claiming that this isn't true. There's a claim of a miracle. And so the world says this isn't true. There's material in the text that shows they had doubt. And so this isn't true. The foundation of our faith is in knowing, believing, pivoting our whole life away from what it is and to it is in Christ because of this being true. And we too often just look at, well, he paid the price for our sin. He said he did that so we'd be forgiven. He said he did that so that we could have life in him. If he can't even raise his own life, and so let's use their own arguments on our side. And we'll add two more ideas. One, of course, with four eyewitnesses, they're supposed to be variation. That's a good thing. That tells us they weren't in cahoots, which is why I don't hold to a common belief that Matthew and Luke took a lot of their information from Mark, the, the uh, majority belief by most scholars, uh, even those of faith, not just ones who are religious scholars, but are particularly religious, hold that Matthew came, Mark came first, and they took from that. The original early fathers, uh, Polycarp being most primarily one of them, he was a disciple, I think, of John, <coughs> said, we know historically <coughs> said, Matthew came first. And so some believers believe that, one of my professors believe that. I hold that view. You don't have to hold that view. But it's related here. They're different because they're all their own eyewitness accounts. And so that's one point to add to. Isn't it claiming miracles? Isn't it showing there some of them doubted? Well, yes. And I think that's a good point. 
And there's variation because they're eyewitnesses. And there's specific stories. There's specific things each person sings because God is an individual God. So let's talk about these three, uh, the, 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 these four accounts again. One of them talks with only like Mary, like she's the only one there. It never says she's the only one there, but it kind of sounds like that. Guess what? It's focusing on what that was to Mary. That's Mary Magdalene and her place in this. Beautiful story. Uh, beautiful place to, to set up camp. If someone wants to say God doesn't think, and Christianity doesn't think much of women. Who's the first people that God, Jesus, let see him? It was Mary Magdalene. Another passage, chapter 4, that, that, that gives a story. Another one uh, says, just as an aside, that she was the first to see Jesus. And the other two just don't have it. Guess what? They weren't in cahoots. They were different eyewitness accounts. And when they're given their account, led by the Holy Spirit, they're doing different things. Now, here's why I believe that happens. You've heard me say this before. The Bible is not just what we are to believe. But if we study it right, he will show us how to think. He will show us how we bring things together. Yeah, I've been taught, called a stickler on words. Guess what? Us pastors are supposed to be that because all believers are supposed to be that. Because the connection is in the clues. That other point that there's specific to people ideas is because it shows the focusing in on the you. Ladies, maybe the you that you see in Mary Magdalene. You remember the story? This didn't really get into it much where... Uh, Peter gets up and runs. Book of John says there are two. The one that Jesus loved, well, he loved all of them, but we know that was a special name he gave John. John admits that he's the second one that runs. No one else has two runners, but he says he was the second runner. And just so you make sure, uh, he, he lets you know that Peter started, but he passed and got there first. <laughs> but then to point to this honesty of the fifth one, then he admits he stopped at the door. And another passage just says, kind of like he was scared. But then Peter came up and writing. Why are all those honest issues of doubt there? Well, here's, here's, here's the truth of ancient literature. It's usually never there. If you look at the, the famous writings, like the historical person, some king will get to write his memoirs, it will never say he was ever afraid. It will never say he ever lost. It will never say he ever doubted because they cannot be honest. If you know anything about ancient literature, especially from a, a source that's supposed to be someone in charge, they're so one-sided. And so the fact that we're saying this is a miracle is, yeah, no, this is a miracle. This is God. It's not me doing a miracle. It's God. And this is an important time in history, and God broke through every physical law to say, I can get you through any problem if you will come follow me, if you will trust in me. Death is no issue for me. Because it is the truth of a miracle, the miracle, that makes everything proved true. Amen. Their doubt, we see the doubt in other places. That's incredibly honest. There's about 120 believers at this time. You'll see it soon talk about 500 believers, and then once they first have their evangelistic event, Pentecost, all of a sudden 3,000 were added to their number, and they grow fast. But it is okay telling us. That's some doubt. It's okay telling us that the first person who had an eyewitness account was a woman who, in that culture, does not have any right to make any legal claim of testimony to anything. But God says, I'm giving her a legal claim. She's the first one. And this is Mary Magdalene. The one that had a questionable past. Not a good little Jewish girl. Because when God loves, he loves everybody. Yeah. Sometimes we need to get that straight. We think who we're going to share with. But when God loves, he loves everybody. Yeah. And when he died, he died for everybody. What did he say on the cross? Lord, forgive them. Those right here doing this. They do. They know not what they do. Amen. So here's what we know. Early in the morning they came. What does Easter call? Dawn. A new dawn, a new beginning. Early in the morning they came. They're coming to do that stuff they do to the wrappings on a body of a Jewish person who has passed. They come and one of the passages talk about them all of a sudden realize, oh, 
what are we going to do about the stone? The stone, we, we can't move it. Some people say, well, see, that's where you have one of the discrepancies. One of the texts says there was a great earthquake. Remember, I said the last chapter, beginning of the last chapter in each one of the Gospels, go check it out, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. It says, there's a great earthquake, and the angel came down and moved the stone and sat on it. I believe that's true. It doesn't, it doesn't contradict with this if you think that happened when the soldiers were there. The angel came and did that and just looked at the soldiers as they were hand off in fear and probably slipped away before the ladies came. And where our, our text just says uh, they found a the stone rolled away. Just a matter of fact, it was just rolled away. <laughs> then they go in. Our passage says, when they entered, they did not find the body. While they were perplexed about this, two men suddenly appeared to them and asked them clothes. So when the angels first appeared with them, they were afraid, another hugely honest moment. Their faces to the ground, that would be a wrong moment. You don't put your face to the ground. Ask Joseph. He got before Pharaoh and spoke about the Pharaoh, and he wouldn't. But they did. God's being honest in, in the gospel here. Why are you seeking the living amongst the dead? It reminds them that Jesus had taught them this has to happen this way. I must be delivered over to man. I must suffer and be crucified on the third day. He rose again. And it tells us right here in the other passage, they didn't understand. Which might have been a little bit about that doubt. It was a miracle. If nothing like that had ever happened and you were there, you'd have a problem with it. I'd have a problem with it. And isn't it cool that the Bible is honest about that? And it's not stepping back of it being the most important event in history. So then they go and tell him. Uh, one of the passages says, she goes back and tells John, and John comes, well, well this is the one that says, she goes back and tells Peter, and Peter comes. Well, she goes back and tells everybody, but then Peter comes. The one with John, in the book of John, have John and Peter told, almost like they're the only ones told. It doesn't say they're the only ones told. It's just fine focusing the story on the two that got up and went. Kind of like the one that just focuses on Mary. Who's the one that Jesus speaks to? There were other ladies there, possibly several, five, ten, or more. I don't think there were at the beginning there. So she gets up, she goes back, she tells all of them. They all have trouble with it. But Peter's got to see. Mm -hmm. So he gets up and goes. Then John gets up and beats him there. And I believe it was less than a quarter mile away because the ladies are following because they'll, they'll appear again in the story. So they get there, they go in, and they all see no one's there. This passage doesn't have it, but the angels show up again and address everyone. So now Peter and John saw an angel that said Jesus was raised. <coughs> I believe at this time, because of the other text, although it seems like they're saying different things, I don't believe we have any contradiction here. The belief of Scripture that we have, all Scriptures God breathed, would say that we don't have and it fits because if God helps us to see what really happened from different details, putting the details together, the guys left. This one says it clearly. Peter got up and ran to the tomb. Uh, he looked in, saw living, and he went away to his home. He just, I don't get it. I don't get it. <laughs> because the guys got to figure it out, right? But, you know, the ladies stay longer. Is what happens. And I think all the ladies... But Mary, believe it's you. Because that's when it says, if you look at these other ones, when it talks about the one that just shows Mary, she she has a little time just for the angels. And it's talking about where's the body? I'll tell me where it is. And Jesus addresses her from behind. She doesn't know who it is. And she says, Where's the body? Where is she thinks he's his garden. And he says, Mary. And she realizes it's him. And so that's when she grabs him. I think he's coming partially out of the tomb now with her. She grabs him and probably gasps as she does it. And then some of the ladies who are at least in the procession that's left have stopped and come back because the other passage talks about several of the ladies coming and bowing down to him. But it says she was the only one that grabbed him. And so it confirms what's said in several areas. She was the first eyewitness to Jesus. Those are intricate details. If you want to 
have more of a ego than a humbleness before the scriptures, there's four different descriptions there. And they say it in such a way that they don't refer to others at all, just Mary, just John and Peter. And so you could believe you see a contradiction. But guess what? That is not the definition of a contradiction. There are no contradictions there. There's details that help us no more. I love to watch their shows when the investigators figure out so many things from so many different ways. That's what God has given us here. And now let's just take a snapshot of the rest of the day. They're struggling with it. And then there's two disciples who are heard about this. They're at the first time when they, when they heard from the ladies. And then they had to go. We wrote to Emmaus. Remember that one? So they're going. And Jesus starts walking with them. But they don't know who he is. And he's like a stranger. What's going on? What's, what's going on in the city here? It's kind of weird. And they explain. And he's just like a regular Joe. is asking questions. And then it gets dark to where it's time to stop. And it says Jesus kept on like he was going somewhere else. They invited him to stay. They made a friend from the stranger. They don't know it's Jesus yet. And then he explains the scriptures to them. And then he breaks bread. And at that point, they're allowed to know it's him. It's nighttime. It's past nighttime. They're concerned enough to say, don't go come and stay with us. And then they get up and go back, I think it's six miles, to tell the disciples. Same day. So it's late. You know, in cultures that don't have light and electricity, when it gets dark, they go to sleep. It's late. They run all the way back to tell the disciples. And, and, and they've, they've all been together this whole time. They, they can't get this. And the Bible's honest about that. But then God wants to nail the message closed. I told her, I let a bunch of them see my angels. I talked to those guys who were going far away. And then when they all came back, except for Thomas, they'll see him next week. He comes in their midst and physically shows himself before all the disciples. I believe more than just the 12 disciples. It looks like there's about 120. That's stated in, in the New Testament. That he showed that he was real. Why didn't he show anyone else? It's important for the world to know. Yeah, we're supposed to tell the world. How well... Remember, we're celebrating Easter and we got to contemplate things better so we can comprehend it better so we can commit fully to it. Mm -hmm. How well does the world know whether that was real or not? They don't have to be here at, be there at that time. Jesus himself, God, his plan didn't let everyone else in there at that time. Because how you believe and live out what you believe will say something about what you believe is true or not true. Mm -hmm. yeah. With a lamb her family for a temporal time God's justice passed over those Hebrew people mm -hmm. to deliver them from a time from slavery later they're under the slavery of the Romans and really under the false teachings of the time and Jesus lays himself down the eternal lamb the eternal sacrifice mm -hmm. not for freedom in this life that's why so many of them were confused particularly Judas he thought it was a physical thing, a this world thing. But he's there to deliver for forever. And who needed to know who he wants to be his go share people are the ones he told. Right after this, verse 25, he says, O foolish men, and slow to heart to believe in all that the prophets have spoken. Again, admitting, even his believers, his closest following, had trouble with the understanding. And so, bring it more to just the day for the past that we celebrate. Bring it to yourself right there in that time. Do you believe in the miracle? Yeah. It is the only name under heaven by which you must be slaved. Do you, say, do you believe that? Do you believe the miracle that justifies everything? Do you live that way? And I'll leave us with this verse. What does this mean we have to do to celebrate right? We have to recontemplate. See all that it's involved here. Comprehend it better. Continue to comprehend it better and commit to it. Not just this little holiday for the past, but all that it's saying. It is the key. It either makes or breaks the whole gospel. And God wasn't afraid to put all his baskets, all his eggs in one basket. Galatians 2 tells us how therefore we should live. Because the resurrection is real. 2.20, Paul tells us 
I have been crucified with Christ, and it's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. See, when he gave his life at that time, and go back past him when the, the, the lambs were paid, that was God's claim for that life. God owns our life. The only way to live right is to live our life given up. If you want to be great, be like your hero. If you're the hero, gave it all. We should give it all. I am crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. That's how I live. Amen. The life I live, and the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. It was done in the past. It's so true. It was done way back then, even before I was born. And he says, 21, I do not do this. I do not nullify the grace of God. It's all we've got. For if righteousness could be a great gain through the law, if I could have done it by being good enough, then why did Jesus die? The truth of the gospel is God loves us. We're in a horrible situation. Sin is horrible. We can't solve sin. And so forever, God had to come into this world and defeat it. And either he did that in truth, either the miraculousness of his defeating that and rising from the dead to prove it's true, either happened or it didn't. Mm -hmm. And so when we celebrate the dawn, we've been in a dark time. I believe it's a huge challenge. Historically, it's going to prove to be a huge challenge to the faith. But all we really need to focus on is our dawn here, our Easter moment. How are we going to celebrate day to day the miracle that God rose from the dead? Are we going to live like Jesus? Are we going to believe him entirely and share him with the world? Can we pray for us? God, thank you that when you first chose people, you picked a guy named Abraham and you gave him a covenant that the world would be blessed through his offspring. Lord, the Jewish people failed in that, but Paul has called us the real Jews, the real offspring of Abraham, to in faith live out the truth of God's grace the miracle proof of his resurrection, share with others so that we can fulfill that most important human commands. Go share the miracle of Jesus so that lives can be changed. Lord, this is our prayer. This is our purpose. Lord, this is our plan. Will you guide us and lead us in the way? Pray in Jesus' name. We rise to your feet. We have a song to sing. If you have a decision to make, the altar is open. I'll be up front as well. What's our song? Page 320. Page 320. Let us stand and sing. It's got to be celebrated more than the day. It's got to be celebrated with all that we have. For all who God wanted to reach with his love miracle. Let me pray for us as we go. God, thank you for your amazing love. Thank you that at the individual level, you want relationship. Lord, help us to give more of our life to you. And for those who've never done that, 
May we share with those that they may learn how to give their life to you. That they may be what we call born again. Their old sinful nature may die. And their newness in Christ may live and grow and be more like Jesus. And reach more people for Jesus. That's what it's all about. That's our new dawn, our Easter to celebrate. Not just in our own homes, but to share it with others. Help us in that. Lead us, guide us, help us encourage each other. And help us do your will and your will today. In Jesus' name, amen.